Well, hello, and welcome to Living in Extreme Environments. My name is Ryan Schaefer, and I'm coming to you live from the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I'd like to welcome to this program Crown Over Middle School in Corinth, Texas, Stephen F. Austin Middle School in College Station, Texas, as well as Space Center Intermediate in Houston, Texas. I'd also like to welcome everyone viewing via the webcast. Now, you've all heard of outer space, right? Well, instead of taking you to outer space, we're going to be taking you to inner space. That's right, 60 feet below the ocean surface is a habitat called Aquarius. And in about 15 minutes, we will be joining aquanauts who are inside Aquarius as we speak. But first, I thought it would be good for you to watch an interview I did a couple weeks ago with some engineers who are directly involved with NASA's Extreme Environment Mission Operations, better known as NEMO. I'd like to welcome two special guests to our studios today. Could you two introduce yourselves and give the students out there a better idea of how you'll be involved with NEMO 14? Sure. Absolutely. Hi, guys. I'm Heather Paul. I'm a mechanical engineer that works here at the NASA Johnson Space Center. I've been out here for about 14 years, and this year I have the fantastic opportunity to work with NASA's Extreme Environments Mission Operations Project, that is the NEMO activities. My name is Amanda Knight, and I'm also a mechanical engineer. I've been out here at NASA Johnson Space Center for about six years now, and this, too, is my first opportunity, and I'm very, very excited about it. Great. Well, thank you for joining us today. I guess to begin, uh, Heather, could you give us a brief explanation of the NEMO program? Absolutely. Well, it's pretty cool, Ryan, because we get to go to Key Largo, Florida for a couple of weeks in May, where we're going to be working with a crew of six in the underwater Aquarius habitat. So that crew of six is comprised of a NASA astronaut, a Canadian Space Agency astronaut, two scientists slash engineers, and then two habitat technicians. And they're going to be going out to the Aquarius habitat, which is about 60 feet underwater, for two weeks to do an underwater Aquarius mission. And that's really NEMO 14, lots of great activities doing spacewalks, doing science objectives, engineering tasks, and overall fantastic opportunity. Well, thank you, Heather. Sure. Um, I guess it might help the students, though, if we uh, actually show them how the habitat, uh, the Aquarius habitat works. And I think we actually okay. have a demonstration that we want to show them in order to explain some of the science involved with, with uh, living underwater. So uh, what, are, what are we seeing here? Okay, so right now what we have is basically uh, – a tank of water, which we're going to pretend is our ocean right now, and the bottom would be about 60, 62 feet down. Okay. And uh, here we've got our glasses, which we'd like to pretend is our Aquarius habitat, right? That's right. So here we A hole right. in this cup. We've got to get in and out, right? Right. Okay. That's true. So. so now we have what we would consider our airlock so that the aquanauts can actually go from inside the habitat outside to do their EVAs. And it's still very much the same thing. They are able to maintain the pressure inside and still be able to get outside to do their work as long as the pressure is equalized both internally and externally. I see. So lots of science involved with living under the ocean. Absolutely. Definitely. And now I think it would be even better if we actually show the students what the real Aquarius looks like. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and take a private tour of Aquarius. All right. Hello, my name is Dewey Smith, and welcome to Aquarius. Uh, I'm one of two habitat technicians. Uh, my job down here is to make sure that the aquanauts are safe, healthy, and being productive down here, and we'll have a successful mission. Um, we're going to start the tour here, as you see in the bunk room. These are uh, where the six aquanauts sleep. It's pretty close and cozy, but it does the job. Um, we don't spend much time in here, so there's a lot of space. Uh, this is where we keep all of our clothes and goodies and books for the for the crews here. Um, if you look forward here, right underneath the viewport and right underneath the grouper, 
Uh, we do have a workstation here. Uh, it's a fold-down station with a laptop with internet capabilities. And that's for anyone to use. And we'll go ahead and come on out here into the main lock. And over here to the to the right here, our starboard side, we're actually looking towards the bow or through the bow of the, uh, to the bow of the habitat. And on the starboard side, starting as a camera, which the watch desk has a constant eye on us 24-7 during a mission. We do have another workstation here. This is for me and the other habitat technician, Buckley. And uh, this is where we have a live chat to the watch desk. So if anything happens, we have a live chat to them, as well as uh, a barrage of phones. We have digital, landline, cell phone. And as we carry on through here, we have a depth gauge here, which shows us that we are at 47 feet of salt water. We have a bunch of monkeys here. Also, <laughs> some of the aquanauts. We got aquanauts coming back from a dive. They're eating and uh, getting their meals ready, getting warmed up after the dive. Uh, underneath that depth gauge, we have our sensors that show the oxygen, temperature, humidity, CO2, and CO uh, readings and alarms there. Further back, we have our air distribution. This is where we get our atmosphere makeup. We have a 30 cubic foot bleed going on right now, and followed by our electrical panel, which has a bunch of buttons and switches there. That's how we get lights, camera, and action. Uh, we have uh, another station here with another computer that also has Internet Connect. Back on the other side, to the port side, we'll see people eating, uh, enjoying the, the loads of food that we have down here. Uh, we have a regular sink and utensils and a microwave like you would any at any kitchen. And we'll carry on through into the entry lock. We'll see another couple aquanauts here hiding out. You can't run from those guys. <laughs> we'll also have uh, the same thing as I pointed out in the main lock. It's mimicked here, the electrical panel, air distribution panel. Right on. How'd the dive go, guys? All right. Good deal. No problem at all. All right, and uh, this is a final space here. It's exactly, actually where it begins is in the wet porch, and the camera may fog up on us, but we'll try to keep it clear for you so you guys can see what's going on in here. This is where the power and air come through into this space right here. We have an air, dis air distribution panel, as we saw in the main lock and entry lock. This is how we distribute it in, inside, and if you can see through these, you can see the, uh, the moon pole. We do have some gear drying. This is where all their gear is staged. This is where we stage out and do our dives and all the work. This is why we're here. Um, the shower is a small space, but it gets the job done. Hopefully you can see that, and there's also another camera in here that is a direct link to the watch desk, and they can watch us from, from here, too. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll go ahead and sign out. And uh, thank you for, for uh, listening and watching, and we will see you guys soon, hopefully out in the water. Good night. Well, that's certainly a fascinating facility, Heather. It's awesome. Um, but, you know, when people think of NASA, they think of launching really big rockets, and they think of astronauts floating in the station. Sure. Um, and that's really different than what we're – seeing taking place at NEMO. Um, so Heather, can you give the students a better indication of some of the differences between living in outer space as opposed to under the ocean? Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. I mean, when we think about NASA, we don't think about going underwater unless we're doing a simulation or a training at one of our training facilities. So what NEMO 14 allows us to do is it's an analog activity or it's analogous to what we would experience living in outer space. And there's definite differences because obviously you're at high pressure underwater and you're at low pressure or in a vacuum environment in space. But there's more similarities and that's why we do the NEMO 14 activities. So for instance, living inside of a habitat, that's just like living in, in the space station except it's actually a much smaller volume. So the Aquarius habitat is about the size of this VESDA module that we 
have on the International Space Station. And we're looking at the psychological and scientific and medical aspects of having a crew of six living in a volume of that, a uh, space of that volume, seeing how they interact, live, and work together. So that's one of the aspects of our NEMO activities. And then, of course, we have EVAs, or extravehicular activities. So just like we do EVAs or spacewalks outside of the space station to maintain the habitat, maintain the station, we do the same things with our Aquarius habitat, where our crew will go outside every morning and afternoon to do a spacewalk. So they'll be checking on the habitat, but they'll also be doing specific scientific and engineering objectives, just like we would do on a real space mission. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, uh, Heather, can't you weigh the scuba suit certain, in, in a certain way to model different planetary surfaces? Absolutely, and that's a really critical part of what we're trying to do. Because as we design our spacesuits, really what we're interested in looking at is how the crew moves, how they feel, is it easy or hard to move around, and to what extent do they have to compensate or change the way they would do a movement to successfully execute their activities while doing the spacewalk. And that's especially critical when you talk about going to the moon or on to Mars, a planetary surface where you're going to have gravity. So what we do with NEMO is we can weigh you out depending on on what gravity level we're trying to simulate. So we can make you neutrally buoyant where you float in the water column, just like you would in microgravity, or we can attach weights to you and weigh you down to one-sixth gravity or one-third gravity to simulate lunar or Mars gravity environments. And that's exactly what we're doing on several of our EVAs this time. I see. And it's a specialized kind of suit. I mean, it's not just a normal, regular scuba suit. This is some pretty advanced materials that you're using. Absolutely. I mean, it's not as advanced as the extravehicular mobility unit that we have in space, but it is a uh, special, special wear, special gear that the uh, aquanauts will be wearing. I see. Well, Amanda, um, there's some other similarities, I guess, between NEMO and the International Space Station. Right. I think isolation is one of them. Definitely. Isolation is a big one. Um, not too many people realize, you know, the different kinds of challenges that actually come about by having six people live in a very, very, very small environment. And um, that's something that happens not only on station, but is what we're also simulating and, and mimicking down here in the NEMO 14. Um, so there is that isolation aspect, as Heather mentioned, trying to look at the psych psychological differences, impacts, so on and so forth. Um, also... One of the other similarities that we have is, is the, uh, the mission control. So whereas the aquanauts in, in Nemo, they're able to talk to each other, there's not necessarily someone that they can just reach out to and be like, oh, you know, I, I need some help. Well, they can talk to mission control, which is, you know, up on Key Largo, but it would simulate very much what we have here at Johnson Space Center when our astronauts are out in space living on the space station. There is that difference. And for two weeks, our aquanauts are submersed underwater. They are communicating just the same way that the astronauts would out in space. I see. So lots of planning goes into to Nemo. Absolutely. Uh, and I think, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. I, I think um, one of the, 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 the things that is focused upon is robotics, really. Right? Definitely. Um, so, Heather, can, can you talk a, a little about all of the robotics research that's being done at NEMO? Sure, absolutely. And robotics is a pretty key element. When we're talking about human space exploration, it's not just humans. You need some robotic assistance so that it's really a great partnership between human and machine. And so when you're developing robotics, it's important to figure out how you communicate back and forth with your robotics and how you would perhaps control it. So for instance, using a remote operated vehicle or driving a rover out unmanned before we put humans inside to go off and explore the lunar traverse and terrain, that's a really key aspect. And in fact, we're definitely doing those kinds of things with NEMO during our spacewalk activities. And these uh, robotics could be a, a rover like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, right. So I think the acronym that we use is ROV, Remotely Operated Vehicle. Sure. There's, what size do they come in? I mean, are they small or do they get bigger than that? It really depends on what you're trying to do with the ROV. So we do have a mock-up of um, one of our Lunar Traverse rovers that you would actually sit in and drive, but then we do have a much smaller, it's about, you know, 
this big, kind of a small little guy that's our remote operated vehicle. And so it just really depends, Ryan, on what you're trying to do. Um, we have robotic assistants that need to be very small so that they can move quickly. Say, for instance, if you wanted them to go out and scope the lunar terrain and, and look at different geological or rock structures, but then you might need something bigger if you need to, say, drill into the lunar surface or go take your habitat somewhere else on the lunar or Martian surface. That's very good information. Thank you so much for joining us today, Heather and Amanda, and I hope you two accomplish um, many, many things during NEMO 14. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right, students. I hope you enjoyed that interview, and now the time has come to speak with an aquanaut. Is there an aquanaut with us at NEMO 14? Good morning. There is. Uh, Tom Marshburn down here. Uh, morning, astronaut Tom. and now officially an aquanaut. I see. Well, we have some very excited students to, um, that, are, that are joining us this morning. And um, before they start asking you questions, I thought that you might want to give the students out there a, 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 an explanation of the NEMO program. And, and maybe you can talk a little more about yourself and, and what your role is in NEMO 14. Yeah, sure. As I mentioned, I'm an astronaut uh, trained uh, for space flights when I'm not actually able to go on a space flight. I flew last year, uh, last summer, and did a few spacewalks. And uh, one of the things that NASA likes to do is to keep uh, their NASA personnel trained on what it's like to work in an environment like space. It's very difficult and expensive to go to space, so we try other ways to do this as best we can. One of the best ways, in my mind, this is the best uh, space flight simulation I've ever had, is to live and work and do science, uh, do good work here in a habitat 70 feet down under the surface of the ocean. So it's called the NEMO project, the NASA um, Stream Environment Mission Operations Program. So we're actually doing uh, operational research that NASA needs to get done. We're uh, doing marine research and we're also uh, learning how to work together as a team as if we're living in a spaceship. So it's really cool. I see. That's uh, very interesting information, and I think the students now are seeing the Aquarius habitat that you are that you've been living in for actually several days now. Can you give the students out there an idea of um, uh, what you did yesterday? Yeah, standard day. Uh, actually, yesterday was special as a day off because all the other days have been so busy. Uh, we took a lot of naps yesterday. We needed to catch up on our sleep. A typical day, though, you wake up, we do a lot of life sciences experiments, experiments on ourselves. Uh, so we, we had to draw blood, we're there sampling our saliva, we're doing lots of little uh, psychological tests every day, see how we're working as a team. So you do all that, you eat your breakfast, which is kind of like backpacking food. All we have is hot water, we don't use a stove or anything, that would be too dangerous down here. And then uh, do all the normal things you do in the morning and then get ready for a, a EVA, extravehicular activity, or it's really walking on the bottom of the ocean, kind of like a space walk. Uh, but what we are done, doing is being weighed out, so it's like being on the moon or being on another planet. So we're doing a lot of work outside. Each one of us will spend two to three hours outside the habitat, walking on the bottom of the ocean, hooked up to uh, an air supply back to the habitat, and then uh, eat our lunch, have another uh, spacewalk, come in, have dinner, and then we have a lot more science to do. Uh, we'll actually uh, keep a journal. We've been uh, tweeting, if anybody's been following that, uh, through uh, Twitter. Uh, and that's basically what our day is. We're usually pretty tired about 10 o'clock at night when we go to sleep. I see. Well, certainly it sounds like you guys have been doing some uh, very hard, important research. Um, and I guess with that said, we can, we can start um, asking questions. I think we have some very anxious uh, students out there. And um, uh, we have three schools. I want to make sure, though, that Space Intermediate may, w w was maybe having some uh, connection issues. I want to see if they are there, because they may be the first ones that can ask a question. Space Intermediate, are you there? All right, well, well, we'll try to keep connecting with them. But um, we can go to Crownover Middle School, Tom. They are from Corinth, Texas. So Crownover Middle School, go ahead and un unmute your mic and ask your first question to Tom. Crownover Middle School, are you there? All right. Well, with video conference, sometimes video conferencing, sometimes we have to be patient. Uh, maybe we can go to the third school. Is Stephen F. Austin Middle School there? And if so, unmute your mic and ask Tom a question. Um, how much did it cost to start this project? 
Hey, Stephen F. Austin, middle school. How much did it cost to do this project? You know, I don't actually know. Uh, you could ask some of the other uh, folks that support the, the mission. Heather Paul, you just heard from. Uh, what uh, we do, though, is partner with other groups. We've partnered with the University of North Carolina at Wilmington with another government agency, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and uh, Atmospheric Administration. And so all together, and, and NASA has put some money in so that we can do this uh, project together. Um, you probably know the word synergy, and synergy means everybody coming together to make something that's even better than just the individual parts when it's together. That's definitely true here. Uh, some of the uh, uh, machines, the communications, the computers that NASA has put down here for our project, the marine biologists have been using for their research all the whole rest of the year. Because this place is very active. It's used usually by oceanographers and marine biologists. And so we've all been able to use each other's uh, equipment and come together and sort of all year long been able to do a lot of great research. All right. Well, thank you. Good question, Stephen F. Austin Middle School. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, Crown Over Middle School. Can you guys holler out to us if, if you're there? They may have been having some microphone issues. Crown Over Middle School, are you there? All right, well, we're going to go ahead and stick with Stephen F. Austin Middle School for now while those um, issues get sorted out. So Stephen F. Austin, go ahead and open up your mic again and ask another question. Does the length of time that y'all are down there affect y'all's health? Does the length of time we're down here affect our health? You know, it does a little bit. And I have to say, you know, we're losing communications with other groups. That's why we do these things to find out what problems are and get better and better at it. But um, it does a little bit. And so uh, I'm a medical doctor. You don't have to have a doctor down here, but there is a medical kit. And um, what happens, uh, we are living at two and a half atmospheres. So the air pressure is kind of like the inside of a bicycle tire. It's about two and a half of what you feel there in the classroom. So that's a lot of extra oxygen, a lot of extra nitrogen. Because those are the main components of air. And that's all getting pushed into our bodies with the increased pressure. That means we cannot go back up to the surface or our blood would bubble with nitrogen just like opening a Coke can. And that would be very bad for us, be very painful, and could kill us. So once you're down here for a little bit, you can't go back up quickly. It would take about 16 hours for us to slowly reduce our pressure down here. That's what we'll do at the end of the mission. And then we'll be able to go back to the surface. So we really are very, very isolated here. We can't go back to the surface without hurting ourselves or, or really killing ourselves. Uh, we're living at kind of a it's kind of a moist air down here because we're connected up to the water. That's how we get in and out of the uh, habitat. And so, uh, and right now we're doing a spacewalk right now. So every once in a while I can hear the hear the voices talking. We're we're always really busy down here. The, um, so with the increased moisture in the air, it kind of affects your skin. You can get some rashes, that sort of thing. But otherwise. Uh, Everything feels normal. We're all feeling really good, really healthy. We're just uh, busy, and things are working out real well. Great question. That's right, Tom. And um, I keep noticing that you have some company off to the right of you. There's a there's a porthole, and there's some company there, right? There's some fish. Have you seen a lot of ocean wildlife lately? I'm sure you have. Yeah, you know, living down here is a lot like living in space because uh, you're right, you're, you're looking at all the fish that we see every day. And we put the little film up there to make it a little bit easier uh, for the cameras to work, otherwise it would wash out. But you um, see all kinds of fish, especially at night when they start feeding. Uh, you're seeing a picture of a grouper right, right now. That's a really interesting thing to see you go swimming by. And uh, so it's like living in space. You always are attracted to the windows, always want to look out the windows, and there's always something to catch your attention out there. Very cool. Well, I think we can um, continue to ask uh, some questions. They, they, there are certainly many, many questions. They are very curious about your mission during NEMO. Um, so Stephen F. Austin, we're going to give you another shot to uh, ask a, a question. So go ahead and open your mic and ask your, uh, another question to Tom, please. Um, while you guys are down there, are you affected by hurricanes or other weather patterns? You know, I never would have thought we would be, but we are a little bit affected by hurricanes. 
and other weather patterns. We have not felt a hurricane here, obviously, but uh, when the weather is bad on top, when the wind's blowing and the waves are high, kind of a day that you wouldn't want to be on a boat, that down here, we can feel it. We can feel what we call a surge. That's the whole mass of the ocean water moving around on the ocean floor where we live. Because we're connected to the ocean, we, you might think we have a door that we open and water pours in. We don't have that. It's actually one end of the habitat is a little pool. And because of our high pressure, that water doesn't come rushing in down here. We just step into the pool and go out and uh, do our spacewalks. And just swim back in and step out from the water and walk into the habitat. And because of that, though, because of that surge, that pool of water raises up and lowers and raises up and lowers several times a minute. And our ears pop every time. So we can always tell when uh, the weather is bad up on the top. And you can kind of see uh, the weather down here is whether the air, whether the water is real silty or kind of milky looking. And right now the visibility is not like, not that good. It's almost uh, like a, a foggy day up on the ground right now. So the weather patterns do affect us a little bit. Alrighty. Well, um, that's, that's very good information, Tom. And I want to um, make sure that uh, we can get as many um, schools involved in this program as possible. So one more time, is Crown Over Middle School with us? If so, can you go ahead and open up your mic and let us know that you're here? All right, well, maybe I can ask uh, Crown Over's questions for them. Uh, Tom, uh, one of the more interesting questions that I thought they submitted was, do technical difficulties occur while you are in Aquarius, such as the loss of communication with mission control, and, and how might you manage these issues? Well, that's a, a great uh, question from Crown Over, because the, uh, that's exactly why we do this, to find out what the problems are. It's one of those things where it seems easy to do, um, but until you try it, you don't really know what can break and what can go wrong and how you're going to deal with it. So uh, things go wrong quite a bit, especially with communications. As a matter of fact, right now we started just a couple of hours ago uh, working as if we were on the surface of Mars. So the speed of light means that if we wanted to talk to you, I would say something and 20 minutes later, you would receive it in your microphone and you, in your um, speaker and you'd hear it. And then if you responded back to me, it'd take another 20 minutes. So right now we are practicing and are not talking to the ground except through this uh, teleconference. Uh, we're not talking to the ground except with a 40 minute delay at least. And how we deal with that is, and what are the best ways to work that way, is what we're trying to figure out. Is it email? Is it video? Is it just trying to talk like this? It, probably not talking on the phone is a good idea because that's, that would be really frustrating to say something and wait 40 minutes for an answer. So Things break all the time and we're training to uh, work around that, uh, figuring out how to fix stuff as fast as we can, and uh, so that's a part of living down here. I see, Tom. And this is only possible through something called a buoy that's attached to Aquarius, is it not? That's right. A buoy attached to a cable down to the habitat so we can uh, talk on cell phones and just like we're doing now. I see. And I think the students are, are seeing some video of that, of that buoy that's connected to Aquarius. So uh, that's your life support. And um, you guys only, uh, I mean, you're, 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 you're almost wrapped up with your, 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 your Nemo research. I think you only have maybe a couple more days left in this mission. We've been down um, for a week. We have one more week down here. And you saw a fish come by. We might have a couple of other visitors come by here. And uh, so we still got some time. But we're really enjoying ourselves quite a bit. And it's, uh, uh, we're, we've settled in though. We're now it's in such a tight quarters with six people living down here. You kind of you stop saying excuse me because when you're bumping everybody because you're bumping into people all the time trying to get around each other to get your work done. So we're, we're almost like one little, uh, one little organism working together now. It's really interesting. Well, certainly there's some teamwork involved. That's, to, to, that's the least to be said. But um, maybe the students out there would uh, be interested in how you get picked for a mission like this. In fact, Space Center in Intermediate uh, in Houston here uh, wanted to, to know, they actually wanted to ask you that. And unfortunately, I don't think they were able to connect, but maybe they're watching on the webcast. Uh, so how, how do you actually get picked to become an Aquanaut? Well, uh, to be an aquanaut, as far as I know, um, because I'm being an astronaut, uh, I was allowed, since I'm uh, in line to become uh, 
uh, an astronaut living on the space station as my next mission, they like for us to have this training. And so as an astronaut, you, you can become an aquanaut. Uh, however, most of the time, uh, and you're seeing a picture of the entire support team, the aquanauts are there in the red shirts, and otherwise that's how many people it takes to support us and to get all the work done. But if you're uh, not an astronaut, you can become a marine scientist or an oceanographer. And they, they come down on a regular basis for the rest of the year and do research. As a matter of fact, most of the time, they are here in the habitat doing their research. So uh, a lot of ways to get down here, and uh, believe me, it's worth it. It's a lot of fun. Well, very cool. Um, now, Stephen F. Austin, I think um, you may be out of official questions that you submitted, but you are free to ask any other questions of Tom if you'd like to at this point. Stephen F. Austin, are you there? Uh, yes, we're here. Uh, I'm one of the teachers in the program, and I had a question. Uh, we are familiar with some of the uh, astronauts that have been up in station as well as participated in NEMO. And uh, like the gentleman we're speaking to, uh, how exactly, what kind of training do you do over there that prepares you for the mission up on station? It's a great training environment, the best one I've ever been in. It's mostly all about uh, living and working together with a team in very tight quarters. The other aspect that's very unique is just knowing full, full well that we are in a dangerous environment. Uh, space is a very dangerous place to live, so is under the water. We're totally reliant on our habitat to keep us alive. We do all kinds of uh, checks. We have checklists. Life is, is very structured, and it has to be. So learning how uh, to deal with that psychologically is one of the things we learn to do down here. So the training is very important. You know, I should say, you may know that, uh, and uh, scuba diver there, we have uh, divers coming up. There he's saying hi. He's got a, he's got a brush. They got a brush there. Occasionally they do a little cleaning on the outside of the habitat. That was great. Uh, we do have surface divers that come down, <coughs> excuse me, that come down and uh, provide some help to our spacewalk, some equipment that we need every now and then. They're not down for very long, just for about a half an hour, 40 minutes, so they can go right back up, unlike us. Um, but so the training here is, is uh, very important, I think, for uh, getting ready for a space flight. That's uh, very good information, Tom. And I think um, I, I have a, another question for you. This was actually uh, submitted by Space Center Intermediate. Um, they were actually interested in, in hearing about the most interesting, the interesting thing that has happened so far during the, the NEMO 14 mission. Is there any uh, really good stories that you can share? Boy, every day and every moment, it's just like space, is, is really interesting. Uh, one of the, the coolest things we've had a chance to do is to do a night dive. So uh, we didn't have to do any work specifically. We didn't have to wear the heavy vests that weigh you down so you can feel um, uh, get pushed onto the ocean floor like we do on our regular spacewalks. Uh, so we could uh, jump around a little bit on the ocean floor, and we did it at nighttime on Saturday night. Uh, they allowed us to go out and just to uh, look around outside. Uh, you may know that if you use a flashlight, you can see the real colors of the coral because the filtered light from above doesn't allow you to see all the pretty colors. And so getting outside with a flashlight and seeing all the animals that come out at night, so lobsters and stingrays and uh, um, sea cucumber, this big old huge uh, sea cucumber, uh, all these animals, uh, and just to see what it's like when it's completely dark walking on the ocean floor, that was very fascinating. Uh, also, you can wave your hands and see a blue-green uh, light, phosphorescence, uh, all around you. It's just absolutely beautiful. So that was probably the uh, funnest thing I think that we've done. I'm sure that was something else to see, Tom. Now, Crownover Middle School had another good question that I wanted to ask. Um, this actually comes from a student named Ellen Biggerstaff. Um, she was curious about how this underwater environment changes your behavior, because I know when you're in... Um, Living aboard the station, your behavior certainly change, changes um, somewhat. But how does your behavior um, change specifically when you're in Aquarius? 
Yeah, that's a, that was a great question because you know, we all talk about uh, your behavior changing in a, a high stress environment, which this is because it's a dangerous place to live. It's very busy following a timeline, a highly confined environment because all six of us are in this little place. Um, but being underwater separate from space, we still like to look out the window. But I think the view out the window is a little bit slower, a little more peaceful than the view out the, out the window in space. That is uh, really spectacular. And in this case, it's also very pretty, but I think it's, it's a little more soothing maybe than uh, the view from space. The other difference is just the uh, feeling that you get living in a moist, high pressure environment. You heard me cough once. That's actually pretty common down here. The throat gets kind of dry, and that's because of the excess oxygen. It kind of irritates the throat a little bit, so you cough every now and then. It's not, not an infection or anything. Um, and then I mentioned, you know, getting rashes, that sort of thing. Our ears popping all the time. Uh, th that's very different, and you have to get used to that. Um, sometimes it can be a little hard to sleep at night because the, the surge makes your ears pop. Those are the main differences. I see. Well, it looks like we have approximately eight minutes left with you. Um, I wanted to, to, to give Stephen F. Austin Middle School another opportunity, though, to ask Hello. Uh, Tom Hello. Welcome to question. the conferencing system. So, Stephen F. Austin, to join a conference, you, you may use the far end camera controls on your remote. Please enter the conference number followed by the pound key, or press star to create a new conference. All right. Well, it looks like we're trying to get Space Center Intermediate connected. In the meantime, though, Stephen F. Austin, do you have another question for Tom? Sure. Um, what would y'all do if y'all's life support system goes down? Did you hear that, Tom? Great question. Yeah, sure did. What would we do if our life support system went down? Great question. Uh, you got to plan for that. You know, you have to be ready with a backup. And so our backup is a little dome right outside our habitat. It's a little white dome. You can swim up. It's got a bubble of air in it. And all of us, all six of us, can swim up. We can't all fit in there, but if you're standing, if you come up, you're about waist high in the air, in that dome. And all six of us were really close in there. We could all breathe that air. And there's actually an oxygen line there that we could open the, open the oxygen line and breathe the oxygen. So let's say there's got a big hole in this habitat for some reason. All the water rushed in you know, from, uh, from above or something like that or lost all our air pressure then we'd all swim out, or maybe there's a big fire. Then we'd all swim out and we'd go into that little dome and uh, we'd still be alive. And then maybe the uh, ground would be able to come down and fix things. If we had to, we would actually have to stay in the dome for about 16 hours as they change the pressure until we figured out a way to get us back up. Uh, maybe they'd have to bring down another chamber because they couldn't take us back up to the surface right away or we'd get the bends, like I mentioned, with those bubbles in our blood. But so we do have a way out. At least we could live in that dome for as long as we needed to until they figured out a way to get pressure back on us so they could slowly bring us back up. Well, that's good to hear, Tom. NASA is always uh, safety minded, and we always have backup plans for our backup plans. I do want to say that Space Center Intermediate looks like they uh, connected to us. So, uh, good morning, Space Center Inter Intermediate. Are you there? All right. Well, good morning. We have Tom Mashburn with us. He is an aquanaut. Marshburn, I'm sorry. He is an aquanaut under, um, living inside the Aquarius habitat off the Florida Keys. And I uh, have asked him a couple questions from uh, uh, the questions that you already submitted. But let's see if you can um, ask a question, and maybe Tom can put a different spin on it if we've already heard it. So go ahead and uh, open your mic again and ask Tom a question. Hello, my name is Brian Lara, and my question is, how did you get picked for this mission? Hey, Brian. Good to hear your voice. Welcome on board. Uh, good to finally connect to you guys. Um, I uh, actually, all of the astronauts have the opportunity to do this mission because it's such good training for space flight. But what we talked about before was uh, all the different ways that people can, uh, the different kind of jobs you can have to work uh, down here in the habitat. You know, one thing I didn't mention is uh, two people that live here with us have one of the coolest ways to uh, get a job and, and work down here at the habitat, either through the military or through uh, civilian operations. They are professional divers. 
and so they um, have had all kinds of really cool jobs prior to this one even, uh, but this is their job is to run this habitat and make sure it runs safely and smoothly. Uh, but we also talked about getting uh, degrees in oceanography or marine science, uh, becoming an astronaut. Those are all ways to be able to work down here. Well, that, that was a good question, Brian. And I think um, there is another student at Space Center Intermediate named Jacqueline O'Brien. I think she has a good question for you. Jackie, are you there? Um, you um, hi, my name is Sandy Berger, and I'm asking Jacqueline's question. Um, how do you cook, sleep, and live underwater for 14 days? How do you cook, sleep, and eat uh, for 14 days? Well, we eat backpacking food and we use hot water, so we they don't want any open flames down here, so we don't have any stoves. We do have a little microwave, but it doesn't work very well. I don't know if that's because of the high pressure. Maybe y'all can tell us whether that's uh, due to the high pressure or not. I was kind of wondering about that. Um, so we're usually eating out of a bag or out of a bowl, something like that. We have a little refrigerator, so our only fresh food is maybe some oranges in there, a little bit of milk uh, that's cold, but that's about all we've got in the refrigerator. And sleeping is we have a tiny little bunk room. Uh, there's six bunks in a little room about the size of a closet, and so we're all tightly packed in there like sardines, but it's still very comfortable. And um, sleeping, I mentioned before, sleeping is a little bit hard because your ears pop all the time if there's a lot of weather, a lot of wind on the surface, and there's a big ocean surge. And as that ocean, that water mass moves around, it compresses the, the air in our habitat, and you can feel your ears pop. Uh, sometimes you can even feel it rock the whole habitat, so it sways like you're on a boat a little bit every now and then. So that's kind of a neat thing. You know, one thing I should mention, when you're cooking down here, we just found this out, the water is very, very hot. And as a matter of fact, it can be hotter than what it would be boiling hot on the surface. It won't boil down here because of high pressure, because water boils at over 200 degrees down here, at about 218 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have to be careful about burning ourselves with the water. You might not know it's so hot. Very, very interesting. I think we have time for maybe one last question, and then you can wrap it up for us, Tom. Um, there's a student at Space Center Intermediate named Daniel Penley. Can you go ahead and open up your mic and ask your question, Daniel? I'm Daniel Penley, and um, if something went wrong, how long would it take you to decompress and surface? If something were to go wrong, how long would it take us to decompress? Uh, because of the length of time we've been down here, it would take us 16 and a half hours, so most of a day, to decompress. So what we're going to do at the end of the mission is close off the hatch to that water column I was telling you about so that we are completely isolated from the pressure around us, and then they're going to slowly pump the air from the habitat back up to the surface so we drop our pressure, but they're going to do it very slowly so that the bubbles don't come out in our blood. And so it'll take about 16 hours. We're at least that far away from ever being able to get to the surface. All right. Well, thank you for that answer, Tom. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to the students? Maybe um, some encouragement as they go through school, as they grow up, or even um, something about careers? Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the cool things about doing this job, I knew that being an astronaut was, was a great job. I've always thought of it as one of the best jobs you can have. But working with the uh, habitation technicians down here, working with the engineers we've had a chance to on spacesuit design, there are so many jobs that are so fascinating. And every once in a while, you get to do something like this. Come live on the ocean floor and fly in space. Uh, all kinds of things that are incredibly fascinating and interesting. So. Uh, for everyone, it's it's all just waiting there for you to grab it. Find something that you fall in love with and uh, try to become a master at it. Become as good at it as you possibly can. And usually that's easiest with something you love. But uh, I'm a very curious guy. If you're curious about anything, uh, do everything you can and learn what you can about it because it makes life very, very interesting and a lot of fun. And thanks for tuning in. It's been good talking to you. That's right, Tom. Thank you for joining us, and I'm sure the students uh, uh, certainly appreciated the time that you spent with us, and uh, we'll go ahead and disconnect now. So uh, thank you again, and goodbye. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that, students. Um, we do have some additional time if you guys um, want to give me some feedback of what you thought of this event. Space Center Intermediate, I know that you were able to connect um, a little bit 
later than uh, you may have wanted to, but you were able to get a couple questions in. Did you have any um, questions or anything that I might be able to, to help you with or any thoughts about your interaction with Tom? All right, we got a volunteer here. Okay, um, hi, my name is Tristan Parton, and I was wondering if NEMO funding will be cut if Congress does away with manned space flight. Oh boy, that's a that's a hot potato question, and 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 things do get complicated when politics get involved. Um, I know I can say this for sure. Um, you know, President Obama has. Um, planned on giving NASA six more billion dollars in the near future to um, come up with new technologies to help us go to um, Mars quicker. Um, but as far as the NEMO program is concerned, I am, I, it's hard to tell. Um, I think we, we have a bright future here at NASA as far as human spaceflight is concerned. It's just going to look a little bit different than it has in the past 20 years with the shuttle. So we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, certainly people your age will be involved with um, the space program. So again, like, like Tom mentioned, you can, you can study hard in, in school, especially in things like math and science, because certainly there's a lot of math and science involved with exploring outer space. Um, now, is Stephen F. Austin still there with us? I'm sure you are. Stephen F. Austin. Yes, we're still here. Awesome. Now, did you guys enjoy this program today? Yes. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Did you have any last uh, comments, questions for us before we... And, and, and um, yeah, Space Intermediate, I think you're still, uh, you still have your mics on, so if you could go ahead and mute your mics, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and get with Stephen F. Austin to see if they have any last things to wrap up with. Uh, have you encountered any dangers or anything that has uh, affected your uh, NEMO project? You know, I, I, like I mentioned earlier, NASA is a, uh, an extremely safe organization, and um, uh, they're, you know, they, they try to do things underwater as safely as possible. Uh, so they plan, plan, and, 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 and have backup plans for their backup plans. So as, as, as far as I've heard, NEMO 14, this particular mission off the Florida Keys has gone uh, very, very successfully. And I'm, and I'm glad to hear that. You can certainly follow um, the Aquanauts' progress if you uh, visit our website at www.nasa.gov. Uh, if you go ahead and go to that website, you can visit uh, or you actually can type in the NEMO program and we have our own page set up uh, so you can learn more about the aquanauts that are there and you can also visit a lot of social media sites so you can, you can see uh, all of the wonderful things that are happening uh, in Aquarius. So um, again, I hope you guys enjoyed this time we spent with Tom Moshburn, the aquanaut inside Aquarius. And with that said, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week, and goodbye from the Johnson Space Center.